there's nothing wrong in not being that perfect mother or your child not being that perfect child because if you're trying to be a good mother it goes against the grain of that you cannot be a good mother you will be a very frustrated mother a very irritated mother resentful mother because you're a mother for life it's not an expiry date kind of thing that you know in 10 years everything will be fine the child will be on her own and this and that but i think you have to hang on to yourself which is what this film is also about that you can't lose sight of yourself that's a very big <laughs> <laughs> Hello uh, I am Srijita Sen from News 18 Shosha how are you Hi nice to meet you Nice to meet you too how are you Natasha ma'am Lovely to meet you I'm good very excited to do this <laughs> Same here So you know I just saw the film a couple of days ago and I really loved the concept and so like Natasha ma'am I would like to begin with you what is the most appealing thing that you found about this particular story So you know um the reason I wanted to tell a story um about pregnancy and motherhood is it is shocking to me how little we see this phase of women's lives on screen so you know you see women be young and sexy you see women as old mothers you see women as grandparents on screen but you don't really explore this really important part of their life the transition they make while they're pregnant you know um and i feel like um through birth what we wanted to do is take a very tongue in cheek look at the what the pressure women feel to sort of reinvent themselves as good mothers while trying to hold on to who they were so um that to me is really really interesting that i feel like we've managed to make a very unique and engaging film about a very necessary topic and of course i'm very very excited to have been able to work with lilith ma'am and shreya dhanwantri in in roles that i think you've not seen them in before so coming to lilith ma'am you know this because this film uh, revolves around pregnancy and motherhood what does the, these two words mean to you oh my god that's a very big <laughs> <laughs> um in the context of the film or just outside the film you know in a personal context in a personal context i was just telling someone just before this that you know in my generation we had children without giving it that thought and so many books and you know we didn't uh sort of think the whole thing through that you know it's going to be a lifetime job and all that we just got married and within about a couple of years i i had my first child at 24 which is very young today you know a part of 24 you're 24 <laughs> but have you had a baby yet <laughs> my sister had a child and she got married a year after me so my mother said what's happening what's happening what's happening and she put so much pressure on me i told my husband listen you will have to just you know prove yourself you will have to have a baby so we went in and had a baby. Uh, now i had a baby uh, i mean i got married at 24 25 and so i was a young mother and i really you know just had it like uh, very spontaneously and naturally and i didn't think about it it was only when i saw the child and i said oh my gosh you know this is somebody i have to raise and take care of in every sense of the word for the rest of her life and oh my god it was such an overwhelming feeling you know that's why young mothers can go into post bottom depression and all that because it it just hits them suddenly it's all great fun while you're having it and all but where the pregnancy is concerned again you know it's all very exciting you're hearing the heartbeat and this is happening and the whole family is so excited and you you know and i love babies i i really love babies so i was very excited it's only when i actually saw the child in my hands that it hit me what this means that it's going to change my life forever all the things i'm used to doing i can't do i can't drop everything in the drop of a hat and drop the baby and go off and do what i want but i did learn one thing which i tried to teach my daughters also is that you know i realized the best way to cope with this is to just make that child a little bit firstly i realized that you have to wait till your children are a certain age because otherwise you shouldn't have children that bond that you form with your child in the first 5 6 years you have to give that time 
if you're not willing to give it, you shouldn't have children. That, that I believe very, very strongly. I mean, no one is compelling you to have children. Today, I meet young couples who say, we don't want to have children. Look at the world, what a mess it's in, climate, this, that, terrorism, 100 reasons, you know. The world is falling apart. I said, fair enough. You know, it's a very personal thing whether you want to have a child or not. But if you do have a child, I mean, have dogs, you know, keep cats. But if you're going to have a child, you better have the time and the bandwidth for it. Otherwise, don't have it. So I had made up my mind that the first five years of every child that comes, you know, that I have, I have to give five or six years. So I had already mentally decided that a lot of things that I want to do, I have to put on the back burner. I can't do them now. But I realized also very soon that I cannot only be with this child all the time. I will go mad because I... I'm qualified. I was doing something. I want to continue doing something where I'm using my mind, where I'm fulfilling myself. And I really feel this, that no mother should give up everything because she just doesn't, at the end, she won't be a good mother. She'll be a, a, a bad mother because she's so frustrated, so resentful, so irritated that there is nothing else in her life, that she can't do anything else. I'm so happy my daughter is a therapist. and She continued doing her sessions even when her babies were small at least a couple of few hours. Otherwise, where are you? You see, you lose sight of yourself and that's very, very unnerving. So I started doing things where I could just give a couple of hours and I was lucky because I had a mother-in-law who was fantastic, who I could occasionally leave my child with, but I had a mother who was a doctor and who loved kids and who was very happy to take care of them with, a, you know, with, a, uh, with some help, uh, with, a, uh, with a maid. So... I could go off for two or three hours. I could take small breaks on a weekend and, you know, when they were a little older. So I was very, very lucky. But I think for your sanity, it's very important that you need to take those breaks uh, from even your own child for a while and go and work and do something that makes you feel fulfilled as, a, as, a, as an individual. So I did keep everything at a low at a low degree for about eight, 10 years, till both of them were like 10 and seven and a half, eight. And then I started my theater company and people don't believe it, but I got into films like in my mid forties and all that. Because when I came here and people said, Are ab thi jab ab 24, 25 I said, I said, I said, Kyunki, hey, this was not on my radar. I was very happy being a mother and doing theater, and, you know, doing many other things. I used to make documentaries and, you know, do other stuff. So I used to design clothes and I had many other interests. Um, so I, I, what was it like for me? Pregnancy was quite easy. I, I didn't get too stressed about it. Um, the child, when it came, was a big, big thing. The first one. Second one, I was a little more prepared for it. But I think you have to hang on to yourself, which is what this film is also about, that you can't lose sight of yourself. Uh, because if you're trying to be a good mother, it goes against the grain of that. You cannot be a good mother. You will be a very frustrated mother, a very irritated mother, resentful mother, if you, if you feel you don't have any time for yourself. So you have to take out that time for yourself. And... Uh, it's, it's a difficult and long journey. I think you have to also be ready that it's a long lifetime commitment. I told someone just now, telling Natasha when I had Neha, that my mother-in-law, God, I hope she's about, when she's about 10, I'll be free, you know. She'll do her own thing. She'll be so busy. She said, forget it. She started laughing. She said, for the rest of your life, you will worry, you will be concerned, you will fret, and you will stress, and this will go on till you, till you die because you're a mother for life. It's not an expiry date kind of thing that, you know, in 10 years, everything will be fine. The child will be on her own and this and that. Of course, the thing is, kids get older and the problems change, but you never stop being a mother. You cannot stop being a mother, you know? So I mean, for- that makes so much sense because my 70-year-old grandmother is still concerned about my 50-year-old mom. So that makes just so much sense. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I really missed it when my mother died. She died at 91. You know? But I felt suddenly like an orphan. 
I said, there's no one to say, why are you traveling so much? Why are you leaving your husband? Why are you not at home more? Are you doing this properly? Are you doing that properly? All the things which you tell your mother, please leave me. You know, and just again, actually, so birth is an interesting take on this because it's a, it's a satire on society's expectations of mothers, right? right. So yeah. it's, it's basically um, we're looking at how women have so many voices in their head about what they should do, shouldn't do uh, to be a great mother that they're constantly feeling guilty. Um, but this is actually a very interesting opposite perspective <laughs> that, you know, when we have so many voices in our head, where, where, okay, what's my voice? But then when you are left to yeah. listen to your own voice, you actually miss having that care, you know? Um, so it's a, it's a delicate balance because um, people are telling us what to do because they come from a, um, from a place of wishing for our well-being. So it's, it's, that's the whole question. How do you balance hearing what people have to say while actually making your own decisions? Yeah, birth, for me, birth, as I was telling uh, someone just now, is really do with what you were asking me, you know? When, what did, did it mean to be pregnant and have a child? You are so conditioned to feel that, you know, you had a child and you have to perform mother. You have everything perfectly from taking care of them physically to their mental well-being, to their emotional well-being, to, you know, every aspect of them. You have to you have to be my daughter who's got twin uh, twins. How she has to worry about an earache in one that one wants to go to school today or not, that one doesn't want to wear, but that one has that interest, this interest. I mean, there are multiple levels on which you have to take care of that child, you know? And society makes you feel that you have to be this perfect mother when there is no such concept. There is no perfect child or perfect human being, so there is obviously no perfect mother. I mean, it's not humanly possible. But the pressure is so much and the weight is so much and then the, therefore the guilt starts coming that, you know, I'm not being this perfect mother. Oh my God, I yelled at my child. Oh my God, I felt like smacking her today, but I didn't, you know. But all these emotions, which are actually quite healthy and normal, that you will get irritated. A child is screaming away in the night for no reason. Obviously, you can get irritated and annoyed. You're human. So, but, but society says, no, you have to be angel-like and saint-like and be so understanding and so tolerant and so accommodating all the time, all the time, you know, which is not humanly possible. So, so I like that it, 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 you know, the trope that you have to be perfect, sort of underlined by a certain character in the film, is actually just a trope. It's not, it's not possible and there's nothing wrong in not being that perfect mother or your child not being that perfect child. It's all okay. It's fine. And also when it comes to things like pregnancy or motherhood, so there are a lot of expectations imposed on women, a lot of stereotypes thrown at them, okay, okay, you have to get pregnant by this age, you have to do this for your child. And if something goes wrong with their child, it's always the mother's fault that you did not look after your child properly, so this went wrong. So, yeah. you know, like in your personal journey, did, like, was all these kind of stereotypes ever imposed on you? No, not consciously. You know, it's a, Sujita, it's a kind of a unspoken thing in society. It's not that, you know, somebody talking to you and saying this or blaming you uh, as such, but it's an unspoken thing that, you know, it is the way you raise your child. If your child behaves badly and so socially, then, you know, he hasn't been raised properly, hasn't been brought up properly, isn't it? So it starts at a very minor level and then goes up if someone's not doing well in school. You know, that's such a huge pressure all the time, which we impose, which is imposed on us. And then we start imposing it on the child that, you know, this is a, it's a demand that you do well in everything, you know, and, and somehow the accomplishments of the children become some sort of a reflection of you that you have brought them well and that, you know, you also take pride in the fact that the child is so accomplished and all that. So these are very crazy kind of uh, uh, expectations that people put on you. And you have to, you have to uh, somehow learn to not get pressurized by them, uh, you know, because then the child feels it. The child's feeling it anyway from peer pressure around. And today we live in such a highly competitive world 
super competitive. Every generation is more competitive than the last. You know, uh, so it's also the aspirations are, are, are always going up, up, up in terms of what they want. So we're living in a very difficult climate for a child to begin with. So I think the parent has to let go and not put such, such heavy demands on a child. They have to let them flower in whatever way. You know, I have a very simple philosophy. I used to tell my children, you will excel and can possibly become brilliant at something you are very passionate about. So you have to find that thing. That thing is your thing, your mojo which really gives you joy where you wake up in the morning and you don't say, this is a job. Now, we are not all blessed to know what it is. Sometimes it takes us some years to figure it out. But so I have often told friends of mine, listen, if your son, he doesn't want to be a CA, he wants to be a DJ, let him be a DJ because that's what he loves. He's wanted to do that since he was in school. You know, and if, and, and that boy, finally, because the father was a CA, the mother was something else. You know, it's, it's not in our generation's sort of um, bandwidth to think of our children becoming dancers or, you know, a DJ or a photographer somehow. It was always those traditional occupations. I myself had to fight it. So maybe because I had to fight it, I know my father was an engineer physicist. My mother was a gynecologist. And, you know, we come from a long family of judges and you know doctors and uncle who set up the medical institute and you know went to mayo and all that so a very professional family and i had to do two ma's to just tell my father that i was sort of reasonably educated and then he said do what you want you know if this is what you want to do waste your brains you know being an actor and a director and theater and all that <laughs> it's your 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 thing you know i i have nothing to say but i he was disappointed it's not what he wanted me to do. He thought my, my mind and my brain was too fine to waste in this. But I didn't care. I fought and I said, this is what I want to do. So I, I did it. And I'm not saying I, I'm very good at it or anything like that. But at least I have enjoyed my life thoroughly. Because I did what gives me joy. Real joy. So I think we have to teach our children that, of course, education is supreme. I feel it doesn't matter. You can be a journalist, you can be a producer. That intelligence and education uh, and that informed kind of mind that you bring to anything is very important. And tomorrow, of course, in our line of business, you need a fallback. Tomorrow, something doesn't work out. You have to be educated. Otherwise, you're going to be on the streets. So I don't, I don't denigrate education and intelligence. I think it's supremely important. But I think you have to find your calling. Life is about finding your calling. And when you find it, there's nothing, nothing that can beat it. Nothing. Because there is such joy in every day that you wake up. And, you know, there is that fire in you which keeps you going all your life. That those who found it, I think, are very blessed. Very, very blessed. And I keep hoping that young people keep on exploring. And also, if that fire burns out, you know, you may find after 10 years, this doesn't interest you. You don't want to be a journalist. You don't want to be a producer. You want to be a writer or you want to go to music. And that's fine. That also, we shouldn't have such carved sort of paths in life. That This is all I have to do. I mean, I'm lucky. I still love theater. I still love acting. I still love directing. But I could very well find something else also, which I love equally. And I want to take a break and I want to do something else. So I think as a parent, to me, that is a very important lesson that we have to let people discover themselves. I have spoken too much. <laughs> well, that was such an insightful thing that you said. You know, my next question is to both of you. So, you know, we also see in this film how the mamas are obsessed with getting the champ baby, if I'm getting the term right. So, you know, in, in today's world, today's generation, how do you think that parents are way too obsessed with their children and way too fixated on making them perfect or something that they are not yeah you know i think i think it goes this um idea of having a champion baby is of course a satire on how much pressure 
parents are putting on their children in yeah. today's day and age, right? But I feel like uh, this goes back to what Lilith Ma'am said, that it's that we've all become competitive, right? So because we're competing with each other, we're competing through our children. So it's not just that we want yeah. our children to be perfect for ourselves. We want our children to be perfect because it raises our standing in society, right? Which is a very toxic cycle that we have to break. I mean, right now, so many of my friends are either getting pregnant or I've just had kids, right? The first thing on their mind, more than, you know, what's the gender of the baby is what school are they going to go to? Yes. Right. Because that's such a status symbol. What school you go to. And of course, now we have a bigger population. There's such few good schools. So we're all competing for these very scrappy resources, right? I mean, even when I was a child, I definitely, I mean, it took me, I think, 10 years to break out of this mindset that, you know, I have to be a perfect child. I have to please my parents and teachers to find my own voice. So I literally like I had to leave the country and spend 10 years abroad to be like, OK, what what is it that I want to do to break the conditioning that I got from my parents? And my parents are great parents. But, you know, that is just that is the way I was raised. And so I feel like we get into this very dangerous cycle of sort of then putting pressure on our children to be a certain way, either to fulfill our dreams or our standing, right? And I feel like that's actually a very key part of this film, the message that, you know, you have to find your own voice as a mother. You know, you have to find your own identity. There's no right or wrong way to be a mother. But then also, please do not propagate that cycle with your children, (laughs) where you raise them in a certain way and then they pass on that message to their kids right someone has to break this cycle this mad cycle that we're stuck in because it never ends so i'll move away from birth uh, for a while coming to you Lilith, ma'am you have been working in films televisions and now ott for like for a long time so you know coming to this the ott bloom uh, the sudden uh, popularity and rise of ott platform do you think that there's any special quality about this a particular platform that gives the actors or filmmakers an advantage that probably films or television could not give them? I think most films are very expensive. I mean, big feature films. Uh, and people were always playing it safe with formulas or, you know, whatever, whatever, what worked, what had always worked. I think OTT allowed people to explore subjects that they had not been able to explore in film. Uh, because the budgets, at least in the beginning, were smaller, could afford to uh, talk about things that they couldn't talk about in. The most important thing I think that that happened was people got exposed to a lot of international stuff, right? That has made a huge difference because that has opened up their mind to a variety of uh, genres, subjects. So they are very willing now to look at subjects like that, even in the Indian context. This was not available before. Yes, there was uh, some uh, international television that you could watch, but it was not on our our TVs. We couldn't see see it easily. So suddenly you have like a plethora of stuff that you can see. So anybody can put on, uh, you know, any of these these, uh, platforms, go to any of these platforms and see some very, very high quality, which has pushed people here also to up their game. Because people are comparing it with work that is outside, where the technical quality, where where the the acting is all of a very, mostly of a very superior uh, standard. So everyone here also said, okay, A, it has opened the doors to to explore all kinds of subjects. It's been a fantastic boon for writers, for directors, for actors, for young actors who were super talented but were just not finding their place in big feature films are suddenly getting lead parts in, uh, you know, OTT series and uh, older people who sort of had hung up their boots and decided that up to koi kaam jada hai nahi kind of thing. Suddenly there's a, there's a revival, you know, actresses who were sort of, let's say, middle age are suddenly getting work, uh, which, which, would not have been possible because it, in feature films it is very i'm not saying this with any uh, any kind of uh, you know feeling of uh, uh, let's say uh, disappointment or anything i admire all the senior actors very much but it is the truth that you know in, in indian uh, 
feature films have very little space for senior actresses with roles with any muscle. And especially if they were very big stars, uh, Surajit, then they want very big parts. They want leading parts, right? And those films are hardly ever made. So suddenly uh, they have space in the, on, uh, on the OTT platforms to, perf to get good roles, really nice roles, uh, which have meat on them, whether it's a Shifali, a Kajal, or you know, so many people who are getting work now on, on OTT and even older actresses, um, you know, Dimple, Adipti, uh, many, many, many actresses who could maybe in some few films have had a small role. Now there are many more opportunities, many more opportunities because the stories we're telling are not necessarily about a young couple or, you know, the standard kind of stories or where the mother is also of a, of a traditional uh, sort of stereotype type of mother. So the roles are very different. So we, I feel it's a huge boon, huge boon for actors, directors, young aspiring actors, older actors and actresses, for everyone. Uh, it's, it's just opened up and it's allowed everyone not just to uh, explore a lot of subjects, it's pushing people, which is what I like, to try to up their game a little in every sense of the word, in the writing, in the performances, in the technical values, in the production values, you know, to find new ways of telling stories because people are now comparing you with international work and you better stand up. Otherwise, they're going to just switch the channel, especially if they speak English. If they don't speak English and they only speak Hindi, maybe they will still stick and watch. And I can tell you when I switch between channels, between an international channel and an Indian channel, Indian OTT, there is still a difference. You know, there is a difference. Unless it's a very good series made here, there is a difference. Uh, and it will keep pushing us to push the envelope improve uh, yeah. but the worry part is how it will affect films that everyone's worried about you know what's going to happen to the theater uh, if, if people know that they can watch everything and so many I have two films that the theater and now they're both releasing straight direct uh, on a platform so that is the that but I don't think that something majorly to worry about because if a producer can recover his money and you know maybe that's the future that is the future and you just have to accept it if you can sit at home and eat your popcorn on a big screen and watch a film unless it's a film you know which needs that kind of big screen experience I still would like to go and see a dark work or something in a in a big hall um, I myself say I'd be quite happy seeing it if it's just a regular film, a comedy or a dramedy or something. I'm happy seeing it at home. So that's, of course, a bit scary. That's what producers have been telling me, that they're very worried about that. So my last question was from Tasha. So going forward, what are the kind of stories that you would like to tell through your platform? So, you know, I set up Boundless Media because I believe that the audience has fundamentally changed, Right as we've been discussing with the rise of OTT platforms, Indians watching global content, our standards have risen and how. So we cannot make the same types of films and shows that we have been making. You know, we have to up our game. So what I believe in is experimentation. I think no one knows, you know, what the audience wants to see and we're only going to find out when we put it out there. So of course, both, you know, this film that we've made is a satirical feminist thriller. My next feature film is Uchai with Suraj Bajatia, which is a very feel-good family film, which has a coming-of-age angle to it. The film slate I'm building is a mix of coming-of-age, young adult, comedy, you know, some genre-bending stories. So I feel like this is actually a really, really exciting time for creators and producers to experiment if we have the guts to. You know, because we're definitely in this new world now. And to me, honestly, it's not about whether a film goes on OTT or theater or whether, you know, it's a short film or a feature film. I feel like we have to take different formats, different distribution methods and reach our audience wherever they are. Correct. 
that's so interesting so you know like uh, my time has come to an end so i have to stop the questions here but i just wanted to like add one last thing like lilith ma'am when you were talking about experimenting and exploring that just reminded me of your role in kalhona and you know it was i feel that is one of your most iconic roles because of how bold and unapologetic that character was and i think that we need more women characters like that now in films and series and you know uh, yeah so that's just one thing i wanted to add because mm-hmm. it just struck me so okay it, this was a wonderful conversation thank you so much for your time and all the best for your upcoming projects thank you thank you Lovely. have a nice day